Okay, good morning everyone. I lost my voice, so I hope uh, I'll make it through the uh, entire talk. I'm going to talk about high-throughput secure multi-party computation, uh, breaking the billion gate per second barrier, and this is uh, based on a series of work with collaborators from bar University and NEC Japan. Secure multi-party computation enables uh, parties to compute on private inputs without revealing anything but the output. And there are a huge number of potential applications for, uh, uh, for multi-party computation. We can compare DNA samples without revealing, without revealing them. We can run learning or data mining algorithms on uh, databases, distributed databases, for example, different hospitals collaborating uh, without revealing their private uh, um, patient data. We can run secure SQL. We can protect, pr uh, protect credentials and biometrics by, for example, splitting keys or splitting templates and then uh, computing on them without bringing them together and therefore achieving higher protection. There's a lot of interest in MPC lately and it's even now uh, being deployed with a few startups working and interest in, in from a number of other places as well. There are two standard models that we've considered, that are, have been considered uh, for uh, security. One is this called the semi-honest model and this is where the adversary is rather benign. It runs the actual code that it's supposed to run but tries to learn more than it should from uh, the transcript. This models things like inadvertent leakage, but also makes sense in the example of different hospitals. The only reason why the hospitals won't bring their data together because they're not allowed to because of privacy law. But they don't really, they're not suspicious of each other, they're actually going to try to actively cheat. Uh, however, in many other cases, we want security against malicious adversaries, and this means that even if an adversary can run arbitrary malicious code, uh, they still can't learn anything beyond what they're allowed to. So this, for example, in the case of protecting keys against break-ins, we would generally want uh, malicious security. Now, secure multi-party computation holds great promise. It's been studied since the late 80s, and we've talked about applications uh, for decades. Um, and they are now becoming more and more uh, important and more and more viable. But the main question is whether we're, actually, whether we're actually able to fulfill that promise. Can we actually achieve speeds uh, for MPC that are relevant for um, applications in practice? There are some applications that we can solve today, and these are things that are being done. Uh, we can do cryptographic operations. We can do bi biometric matching. Uh, we can do DNA matching and things like that. But mid-scale and medium to large scale uh, MPC on large data with very, very large circuits uh, seems to be way beyond reach, especially when we want to consider malicious adversaries, because the malicious adversarial model is one that is much, much, much harder to achieve. And this is the question that we came to, that we, we're trying to solve in, in this work. So we consider a very specific setting, which is secure three-party computation with an honest majority, meaning that at most one party is corrupted, and we want to achieve security in this setting. Uh, it's important to distinguish between two different goals and two different efficiency measures for uh, these types of tasks. One is uh, uh, to consider latency, which is how much time it takes from the beginning to the end. And the other is the throughput, how many computations can we carry out uh, per second. And depending on the application, you will either want low latency or high throughput. Sometimes you may have constraints on both of them. So if you're looking for low latency protocols, the garbled, so-called garbled circuit approach is the approach that typically is taken. Uh, it has a constant uh, number of rounds. Uh, and so even on slow networks, it can be very, very efficient. However, the bandwidth is relatively high, which means it's not so good for getting high throughput. On the other hand, if you want high throughput, then the so-called secret sharing approach is better. It has fast, simpler operations, uh, much lower bandwidth but you need a number of rounds of communication that depends on the depth of the circuit being computed. And so on a slow networks, this will uh, never be good, but on fast networks, uh, these sort of computations, computations can also actually have relatively low latency and can perform very, very well. So we're uh, going to focus on the high throughput setting because we're thinking about, again, carrying out massive computations on, uh, on data, on, on uh, large data sets with massive circuits. Uh, with this in mind, uh, and the understanding that bandwidth is a much bigger bottleneck than computation today in these types of protocols, uh, because crypto has become so fast uh, with the help of Intel and others, 
Uh, we constructed a protocol for the semi-honest model that requires the parties to send only a single bit for every AND gate, and SOAR gates are for free. Uh, and also, it has a very nice communication pattern. You, each one party, each party sends a bit to another, and it goes around in a ring. And in between, you can do computation. The, op the operations are very, very simple with just a few XORs and a few ANDs uh, per uh, gate. And you need to do generate randomness, but you can do one AES operation for every 64 AND gates. Uh, so using AES and I, this is almost uh, uh, for free as well. Uh, the protocol is very amenable to parallelization because of its structure. So we utilized the Intel intrinsics and the AVX instruction set and packed many, uh, um, uh, um, all, many values together in a single register. Actually, in the semi-honest implementation, we used 128-bit registers. Now already Intel, instruction, Intel chips have 256. The next generation is even 512. Uh, and with a highly optimized implementation and packing uh, each core receiving 12,800 executions in parallel, uh, we actually got very, very uh, uh, good performance. So this is, these are the results. On a cluster of three mid-level servers, so they're not home PCs, but they're not massive machines. They're, th they're 20 core machines collected with a in, in, co connected in a 10 gigabit uh, um, uh, LAN. Uh, we're with a single, just looking at a single core uh, and actually below one gigabit per second connection. So this is actually just a very simple type of setup. We're already getting over 540 million uh, AND gates per second. Uh, at the tw at this scales linearly up to 10 cores. At so 10 cores, we're getting 5 billion, over 5 billion AND gates per second. Then you get some degradation because of the networking. But at 20 cores, we get over 7.15 billion AND gates per second, which translates to 1.3 million AES operations per second. Now, this is uh, truly uh, high throughput. This is a very, very significant uh, computation. You can think of it as an encryption machine where the share is keyed and nobody knows it. But you can think more generally, forget the AES, that's just a, an example circuit. You can think of a large circuit computing, I don't know, a learning algorithm or something on distributed data. At 7 billion AND gates per second, you can actually uh, uh, can compute uh, you know, a circuit with a trillion AND gates in uh, uh, under, 15, uh, uh, under 15 minutes even less, actually, sorry, that's the, yeah, something like that. It's, you can do really, really, really big computations, and this, uh, I haven't got time in this talk to, to compare to previous work, but this is far, much, much, much faster than any previous reported result. Uh, it's a combination of a better protocol with lower bandwidth and simple operations, and also the engineering in the uh, implementation uh, uh, with the parallelization enables us to get uh, uh, such, such speeds. We wanted to see though, how this would incorporate into an actual application. So we considered the problem of Active Directory breach, uh, where uh, in, in Kerberos, uh, if you get the hash passwords, you actually don't need anything else. There's no need to brute force anything, because uh, that's actually what you need to decrypt the ticket granting ticket that you get from the, from the server. From, so if the Active Directory is breached, then everything is completely gone in your whole organization. And we'd like to protect that, so our idea is to split the uh, hashed passwords and keys of servers and, uh, between three different servers, I have separation with different administrators, so there isn't a single administrator that can now steal everything from the Active Directory, and if an attacker breaches the network, he has to steal more than one administrator's credentials. And we uh, rewrote the Kerberos ticket granting server and the client to work in counter mode instead of CBC mode, because CBC mode is uh, uh, inherently sequential, and that would be a problem with latency, but we rewrote them to work in counter mode so they could be fully parallelized. And it turns out with all of the encryptions you need to do, with the service keys, the, with the user's password, and so on and so forth, you need 32 AES operations for every user login. And the result that we got <clears throat> is a latency of 200 milliseconds, which is very reasonable for human login, especially it's only at login time. And uh, with a single core, we can support 3,000 logins per second, and on 20 cores, uh, approximately 41,000 logins per second. This is enough to support uh, a, a login storm of a huge organization. I don't think there are many organizations in the world that need to support over 40,000 logins per second, and this can be done on a single server. So this is a real 
uh, a high throughput uh, uh, computation and a real scenario, and we see that the MPC can actually support this at a scale far beyond what we would have thought uh, until very, very recently. What about malicious security? So semi-honest security is good for some applications. Arguably for the Kerberos application, it's a bit questionable. If someone breaches the Active Directory then, and they have root credentials, they could change the code that's being run there on, or on those servers. Um, so we'd like to uh, prevent that. Uh, you need to prevent, it's much harder to prevent a corrupted party from somehow tampering with values, you need to, to check that they're behaving correctly. And in the past, this has mean, this has meant that Protocols for malicious security are orders of magnitude more expensive than semi-honest security. And so then our high throughput will just go out the window. Uh, we use the so-called uh, multiplication triple approach. Uh, essentially, you, just, you need to generate a huge amount of multiplication triples, and then you randomly uh, shuffle them, and you open some, and you check against each other, and, and so on and so forth. I, I don't have time to go into the details, but I'll just say that a lot of the work in doing this protocol was optimizing every single bit that he sent to reduce the bandwidth as much as possible. And also he found something very interesting, that since we're now working on massive uh, arrays of triples because we uh, want to get high throughput, actually the bottleneck became the cache misses. That was the most expensive thing in the protocol and slowed everything down to a halt, essentially. So we designed a, uh, a cache-efficient shuffling method which is suitable for cut and choose for here, and a very optimized and tight combinatorial analysis because this has a huge effect on the actual efficiency of the protocol. It tells you how many triples you need to open and check and so on and so forth. Uh, our most op optimized protocol sends only seven bits per AND gate. As uh, Nigel said, the protocol is actually really simple. He said moronic, but I'm just translating it to simple. Uh, but actually, from what I understand in the real world, that's supposed to be a good thing that the protocol is simple, not a bad thing. Uh, we have another variant that sends 10 bits per AND gate, but uh, has a, a, a better online phase if you want to separate between an offline preparation and an online computation phase. And then on the same cluster as before, utilizing 20 cores, we get something that, that really is uh, a surprising result. We're able to do uh, compute uh, 1.15 billion AND gates per second. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, so actually it's even not, it's, it's even better than one-seventh of the semi-honest protocol. Uh, that's because of uh, more optimization in, in the implementation. And this translates to about 215,000 AES operations per second. But again, think of computing on medical data or other data uh, again, over 1 billion uh, AND gates per second, so this is the 15 minutes actually, because if you think about a trillion AND gates, then that would translate into 15 minutes. So in semi honest it would be two minutes for a, tr for a trillion AND gates. Uh, for the offline-online variant, we can actually get over 2.1 billion AND gates per second if you're counting just the online time, which is about 400,000 AES operations per second. This is orders of magnitude better than anything that, that has been done uh, until now. So in summary, uh, it is actually possible to achieve very fast rates even for malicious adversaries. Uh, specifically, we looked at the three-party setting with, uh, with an honest majority, but this is suitable for a number of different applications like the key protection op uh, application, like uh, uh, hospitals collaborating and so on and so forth. A lot of them can use this type of setting. Uh, with rates at semi of semi-honor, sort of 7 billion AND gates per second and over 1 billion AND gates per second for malicious, we're able to truly deal with large computations. There's been a lot of interest in MPC uh, with uh, the move to cloud, with the, with the desire to collaborate, to, to carry our computations together, but the bottleneck of the, uh, of the throughput is something which uh, uh, has, to be, uh, uh, has to be solved before we can actually solve real problems. And, uh, and I believe that what we've uh, done here is shown that it can be done. Uh, of course, this is full, these are fully parallelizable, so adding more servers means you will just linearly increase the throughput. And uh, uh, so MPC can be used for much larger tasks than we thought beforehand. Thank you. So we have time for one or two questions. I'm glad there's time for two because my question is not really that insightful. Um, 
I'm not very familiar with multi-party computation and the actual protocols, but you mentioned the malicious and the semi-honest model. I know that the malicious model is, in general, what we want when applying it. To what extent are the protocols that you built for the malicious model just extensions of the ones for the semi-honest model? Do you sometimes directly work in the malicious model, or do you always go through semi-honest to achieve malicious? Um, you don't always have to go, but typically, in terms of the design, that's the way you do. You take a semi-honest protocol and you add things to prevent the adversary from cheating. Um, in this case, we build very heavily on a semi-honest protocol because you can multiply really quickly, so you can generate a huge number of tuples really quickly, and then you just can check them. So it's there, uh, it's based very heavily on it, but it turns out also to be quite a simple protocol, which means that deploying it is not difficult. Uh, what will happen if the uh, servers are in different jurisdictions so the latency is big? Right, so in this type of protocol that's not suitable for that. You would, you would want to use something like a garbled circuit approach for that. But if you wanted to get high degrees of separation, you could think of, for example, having one server in Azure in, uh, on the East Coast and one in Amazon on the East Coast. You would then still have low latency, but you'd have a high degree of separation between the different servers. So th there are things that you can do to achieve that and still get low latency. Yeah, my question was exactly the same because it seemed to me you're running this in the same cluster, so you're not going to get so much independence between the Yeah, well, the, the independence you can get by having different administrators on the servers, so you can't have any single administrator. That's already a reasonable separation. But 0.13 milliseconds ping time, I think you get within the East Coast, you can set up between different cloud providers and get that sort of ping time as well. Thank it's you. not a completely unrealistic. I'm wondering how configurable these, oh, sorry. Okay. How configurable are these results? Like, how much of the optimization was done because you were specifically computing AES, or how easy is it to just like plug in whatever? You circuit can plug you in want? whatever circuit. The only thing is that you need to build something which will uh, you want to work in uh, run the same circuit at least uh, many times together. But even if you're doing, for so example, learning, you'll often do that. You'll be running the same thing on many pieces of data and then continuing through it. So it's not at all optimized for AES. Okay. 